get started. I'll try and um, keep the template here up to date so everyone as they join can have an idea of what's going on. So um, I'll tell you guys to start. Um, we have a 35-year-old gentleman coming in with fatigue, itching, and yellow skin. Um, what what do you guys want to know or what are you immediately thinking about? Because I hope there are a couple things that jumped to your mind. Hi, Billy. Yeah, I, we got Hi, Billy. What else? Okay. So what else do you guys want to know? What do you, yeah. And this is like a gentleman came in um, to an outpatient appointment. So it's like, you walked into the office saying, I like, I've just had this itching, I feel tired, and then I saw some friends over the weekend, they told me I looked yellow, so I decided I should see a doctor. How long has it been going on for? So that's a tricky question. He has felt this tiredness um, for at least for the past week. Um, and other than that, um, the itching has become more noticeable since his friends told him that he was looked yellow over the weekend. Um, he agrees, but he thinks it must have happened gradually because now he can't help but see it, but he didn't notice the yellow, yellow skin changes at first. Has anything like this happened before? Um, no, he has never had any of these symptoms in the past. Um, Any swelling or waking? Yeah, so he actually, now that you mention it, says that um, at least, and this is actually about the same time of the year, just a couple years past. Um, so since the beginning of the year, he has noticed um, increased abdominal girth. Like he has to keep letting his belt out. He hasn't really been weak, um, but he definitely feels like his belly is thicker. Um, and he has maybe some swelling in his legs. Uh, changes in bowel movement? No, he um, actually has um, it's like an off-ball swelling, apparently. There's no W. Um, so he has a history, and he's seen you before for some chronic constipation, um, but that has not gotten better or worse recently, um, had bowel movements every like three to four days. Did we asked about abdominal pain already? No. Um, so he has, he says he's got pain like right here. He doesn't, on the kind of right upper quadrant, um, doesn't know why. Uh, it, it doesn't bother him all the time, but um, Definitely there from time to time. Any relation to eating? Yeah, so he hasn't noticed that. Um, the, the, the pain changes with eating. Um, but he does, as I said, he's seen this your his PCP before for this like chronic constipation, some indigestion. Um, and then vague abdominal pain that he associates with like rich and spicy food. So what are you guys um, so what are what what are you guys thinking about? You're clearly asking questions in a few areas. So what are we specifically thinking about right now? Yeah. Okay, liver disease, what, uh, and anything specifically causing the biliary obstruction or, yeah. 
So yeah, just still kind of any, could it be anything of like, okay, perfect. And any other system really on your mind right now? Like Camelotics and email. Yeah, and why do you say that? Because um, when you break down so you get um, options that are like Billy, which goes to positive skin, and the body fire lasts as well for the positive. Excellent. So I think really important, sometimes we can like forget to think about blood as a cause of jaundice or um, a hemolytic anemia as a cause of jaundice. That absolutely can be contributing. And fatigue kind of adds to the problem. Yeah, absolutely. The vague fatigue is one of, one I think on our differential or anytime you're working up, especially in the outpatient home with fatigue, thinking about a CDC to make sure it's normal. Um, so kind of just going through a quick other review of systems. The only other thing he notes is he's had, um, so he's, um, has a headache and some vague muscle aches and had a nosebleed recently, which isn't usual for him. Um, it wasn't a large amount of blood, but he just knows it because it doesn't typically happen. Um, he denies any infectious symptoms, fever, chills, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, um, but does say that he has um, one um, or he did recently travel to Texas, Amarillo, um, and he was down there kind of eating in restaurants and eating um, on the road more than usual. He was traveling with his brother most of the time and ate most of the same things, and his brother isn't feeling ill. What the, yeah. So eating on the road meat, exactly. Um, oh, so, so a couple of just quick things from Dr. Albert, always helpful. Um, so hemolytic anemia is good for the high bilirubin, but not the itchy, that's the bile fault. So trying to decide if they're true, true, and unrelated, or the itching is um, leading us more towards the liver disease. And then eat, what does eating on the road meat? Yeah, very important clarifying question. Um, so he was, uh, it sounds like he drove, lives in Colorado and drove to Amarillo and back and was eating at roadside restaurants, often fast food, but sometimes diners. Um, what would you like to know next? History. Yeah, so really minimal, um, generally healthy 35-year-old male. Um, again, he's been seen by his PCP for this chronic constipation with some hemorrhoids, um, as well as asthma, like mild, well-controlled, never been hospitalized or had serious exacerbations, um, no previous surgical history. Diabetes hypertension, and hyperlipidemia in both parents, and a um, maternal, let's see, I believe, yeah, maternal grandmother with dementia. Does he drink or do drugs? more very important questions especially once we've brought up the possibility of a liver disease so he is a never smoker um he says he rarely drinks um at most um four drinks in a sitting and no more than one to two times a month um and then he denies any other drug use any other recreational drug use, never IV drug use. Do you take Tylenol Yeah, excellent question, especially with someone coming in with maybe some arthralgias and headaches. It's even like taking a Tylenol here and there um, in the hopes that it goes away um, and not realizing how much he took. So he actually has taken no Tylenol or NSAIDs. Um, his only prescription medication is albuterol. 
that he gets refilled when the canister expires. He doesn't need to get it refilled because he uses it. Um, and no known mouth um, allergies to medication. No non-prescription medications like supplements and medication. Yeah, that's a really good question. Why are you asking? Is this here asked about non-prescription supplements? Some of those can cause liver injury as well. Yeah, excellent. There's been, um, especially with diet supplements, there's been an association with kind of off-label compounds that are included in it that can cause liver damage of very severity. Um, and some people, I think there was a diet supplement, maybe one of the green tea supplements that people were taking a few years ago that actually resulted in a few people requiring transplants. Um, but no, he, he, he's like, I'm super boring. I don't take anything. Um, he works as, he's like, I'm so boring. I work as a statistical analyst. Like, that tells you a lot about my life. Um, and the one thing I'll say that you, you probably, I'm going to say you would have asked had you seen him in the room, but he had, does have several tattoos. Um, and he says, like, I've gotten these tattoos over a period of years, all from the same shop. Um, in what country? <laughs> in, great question, all in Colorado. Um, okay, before we move on to exam and uh, we'll call it uh, vitals, any other questions? On that note of the tattoos, does he have his like once per lifetime HCV screen? Excellent question. So he has not. Um, he always, you know, he said like he wanted to do it when he was done getting tattoos, and he's not done getting tattoos. <laughs> so, I mean, like, at least, like if I have to get another poke, I want to do it when I need it. I was like, I, he thought about it. Um, so he's like pretty health learner, just not up to date. <laughs> um, so vital signs, I'll read you off. I'll tell you that they are totally within normal limits. Um, but he's a febrile. Um, 38 or 36 8, heart rate 75, blood pressure 123 over 58, respir 16, satting 95% on room air, um, and just for any help with risk stratification, he has a BMI of 30. So pretty average to moderately slender American. Um, physical exam. <laughs> um, he is generally not like well developed, well nourished, not acutely ill appearing, but definitely jaundice. Not highlighter yellow, more like mask yellow, like a yellow skin tone. Um, not the really striking jaundice. Um, and then otherwise, um, a thorough icterus, but. Um, Head, um, head neck exam, otherwise normal, regular rate and rhythm, um, lungs, I do have maybe mild bivascular crackles, um, and he has one plus lower extremity edema to the mid-thigh. Um, skin, and then otherwise, um, no uh, palmar erythema. Uh, spider slang dictasias or kaput. Um, anything else that you'd be Concerned about or want to Pardon? Cardiac thing? Cardiac, uh, sorry, I didn't write it. It was normal. Yeah. No murmurs. No murmurs. Um, I would argue, I think the other thing here that just as we're starting to think about liver disease would be neuro exam, making sure that he's alert and oriented times three, which he is, and no, um, no flapping um, or asterisk. Um, so after this exam, how are you more concerned, less concerned, or equally concerned about the liver? I 
Thucydides glenomegaly, hepatomegaly. Excellent, uh, Dr. Albert. So he um, he does appear to have a fluid wave, um, and the the initialist provider um, thought they appreciated glenomegaly. Um, so quickly, I do just want to talk about. Um, the physical exam for liver disease. Um, I think it's just helpful always to frame these things. So I think ascites, encephalopathy, jaundice, and spider angiomata are some of kind of the most common things we think of in a patient that we're worried about, especially cirrhosis. Um, and so in a large review, um, meta review, looking at the sensitivity and specificity for these findings in people with biopsy confirmed cirrhosis. Um, this Sensitivity is pretty low for all of these, but the specificity is relatively high. So any of them being present is makes liver disease much more likely, but the absence of them shouldn't change your concern for liver disease if you're concerned based on history alone. Um, and then other things like, I think it's worth noting, things like Palmer um, erythema and spider angiomata were initially considered um, most related to liver disease due to alcoholic cirrhosis. Um, but like ongoing studies and repeated studies haven't really verified that, so it's more significant for liver disease in and of itself. Um, in addition, I think uh, this is another um, article on the Rational Clinical Exam from JAMA. There's a QR code to get to it. It's a really good review of um, ways to approach the, the physical exam in individuals with liver disease, um, but again, pointing out that the sensitivity and specificity, the sensitivity for any one of these findings is rather low, um, but the specificity is high. So not having it doesn't mean you don't have liver disease, but once you do, it's like very likely to do. Um, and then finally, I think it's worth talking about how to do a fluid wave, um, because it's very easy, like it's easy to look at an, a distended abdomen and be like, oh, for sure there's ascites in there. Um, and then you put the ultrasound probe on and actually can't find a fluid pocket. Um, so this is just a quick instructional um, tutorial from the evidence-based con medicine consult website. It's actually a really good um, quick reference if you want to find, like learn a specific physical exam finding. Um, the key here is as with most exams, positioning, the patient should be supine um, and they should have, the idea is, what they're describing is trying to hold the skin and subcutaneous tissue still so that fat movement isn't confused with a fluid wave. Um, so it often is either going to be a two-person exam or asking the um, patient to kind of like hold their belly, hold their belly skin. Um, and then you place a hand on between the intercostal margin and the um, iliac crest on one side and tap on the other side and wait to see if you feel flu a fluid wave on your hand. Um, it, I would definitely encourage you to like walk through the process and think about it and try and do it with the patients. It's much more difficult to explain than to do it yourself. Um, so that's my steal on physical exam just because I think it's important, especially for our liver disease patients. Um, so, remember, this is an outpatient visit right now. Um, what, ex what labs do we want to get? Yes, exactly. So, separating cirrhosis from hepatitis versus acute chronic liver disease relative to the exam. So, all of those exam findings we talked about are things that you would expect in cirrhosis. Um, and then a, an acute hepatitis, you would anticipate far more, like potentially like hepatomegaly and t tenderness. Um, and then chronic liver disease, um, if for compensated versus decompensated are important to think about when you're examining a patient, especially in, in relation to mental status. Um, so when you're thinking about this patient, what labs do you want to get to start with? CMP, excellent. I completely agree. Um, and so I apologize, it's going to be a little slow, but I want I do want to write all of these labs out. Um, so sodium comes back at 120. Um, chlor and remember, this is a gentleman like went to work earlier today, came in uh, just to get checked out for his the yellowness. It, it was truly a Monday afternoon. Um, he like 
got off work a little bit early because this was the earliest appointment he could get. K was 4.9. Um, bicarb was 19. Creatinine is 4.9. He did have, and all of these, he had recent lab work from about a year ago that was stone cold normal. Um, so no reason to think that he had any underlying disease. Um, glucose was 79, anion gap uh, 11, and then LFTs, he has a total protein of 5, 4, um, albumin of 2, 8, uh, T billy of 34, uh, D billy of 21, AST, ALT, 145 and 33, and alpha is 51. Okay. I'm sure you guys want a CDC as well, so I'm just going to throw that in. Uh, WCs are 7, hemoglobin, and coags, I heard. Um, hemoglobin is 8, 9, also from a baseline of normal. Um, Platelets 143, INR is 3.85, and P T31, PTT 53. So are we worried about this gentleman? Yeah. Is he going home this evening? <laughs> no, yeah, I think this is someone, it's safe to say, like, we might not know what's going on, but you can't go anywhere except the hospital right now. Um, I think it's a, a testament to how well young, healthy people can compensate in the face of an acute illness. Um, but certainly merits additional evaluation and workup. So now you're admitting him in the hospital. You've got these labs. They're an hour old. What additional workup do we need in this gentleman? Okay. We will absolutely talk about that. Um, any other first line labs that we need to worry about? Hepatitis, hepatitis panel, absolutely. <coughs> and are there would there be any specific hepatitis? Like the low low elevations in the AST and normal ALT kind of make an acute hepatitis a little less likely. But are, would you be more suspicious about one hepatitis over another? I would say hepatitis C versus an hepatitis A would be the two that were most concerning. Um, and I will tell you to uh, avoid any suspense that they are all they, we spent the appropriate hepatitis B panels, surface antigen core, and but all of them all negative. I think I'd get blood cultures. Probably. Blood cultures? Yeah. What are you thinking, Leela? I love that. Um, I mean, it's vital for non-concerning, but like, I feel like cholangitis would be on my differential. Absolutely. We just talked about it. He's like a young, healthy guy. He compensated this far. Who's to say that he isn't about to become febrile, tachycardic, and hypotensive? I think that's super reasonable. Um, yeah. Absolutely. He told us that he's not taking these things, but we have a way to double check that. Um, those are all negative. And while we think about other labs, I will, um, we can go over to the ultrasound. Um, so hepatic cirrhosis with small volume of studies, no focal mass. Um, patent hepatic vasculature with appropriate velocities, direction of flow, and waveforms. No finding of portal vein thrombus. Did he change the name of the pile ducts? They didn't comment on that like that. Like he... they not in this study, um, but if for a, a, at another hospital, I don't have, I didn't have access to. He did get a CT that said normal, normal bile ducts. But I think that's exactly we're seeing like. There's not a, he has cirrhosis, which is maybe an unexpected finding in this previously healthy gentleman. Um, but we're, we're worried about the bile ducts because he has clear evidence of obstruction or some process with his elevated bilirubin. 
something more yeah. PBC and those things that can lead to cirrhosis. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and those were not toxins. Perfect. And then any eosinophil from uh, Dr. Albert? No. So actually, his diff was totally normal. It had a slight, um, a slightly low absolute lymphocytes, um, and the MCV was 104. Can we get a ferritin level? Yeah. Um, his ferritin, I just have to find it because I wrote small, is 2,500. I'll come down here with the blood stuff because 10, 100. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, his fair to his iron top. Um Did he get subsequent genetic testing? <laughs> what are we what for what? For uh no he did not. Um so but it, I will tell you it is this is an hemochromatosis. Um I know it yeah. What other so I think we're in a realm of what could cause like relatively um, occult cirrhosis in a young, healthy individual, and it doesn't seem to be alcohol, and it's not hemochromatosis. Um, he does get a liver biopsy at some point that proves that there's no iron, like excess iron deposition. Apple? Yeah, I love <laughs> the non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. That is fast quickly becoming the number one indication for transplant in the U.S. Um, and that should certainly be on our differential. Um, how it would, and unfortunately, once you progress to cirrhosis, you don't know if it was napples. Um, so that will stay on the differential until we kind of eliminated other causes. It, well, yeah, if you, can, if you can see the steatohepatitis prior to it progressing to cirrhosis, then you know um, it was napples. Um, but once someone has cirrhosis and the fibrosing and scars, you just can't, you can't necessarily tell what caused it. Um, so absolutely. What else? Um, yeah. Oh, perfect. Um, so the Ascaris um, parasite can also cause, um, the, can also cause cirrhosis. Um, and he had no EOs, he did ovid parasites that were all negative. Yeah, absolutely. What are you thinking about with this chest x-ray? Um, I don't know how fast, but if you have evidence of emphysema, we can use the whole in the whole system. Yeah, absolutely. So that's exactly one of the other like few things on the list that cause that are able to cause cirrhosis in young, healthy people. Um, and so this is his admission chest x-ray. Um, what? What do you appreciate here? I guess first looking for that emphysema. And in in alpha one, you would expect to see it in the bases, and I don't really see that here. He's also really people expanded. He didn't take a deep breath, so it's kind of hard to tell. But yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like a poor inspiratory result, um, and not no clear evidence of emphysema. Certainly if it was very mild, that like lack of inspiratory effort could or results could be masking it, but I think less likely. Um what else but what else do you notice? Or and I agree, like you can kind of tell already that he's got um and I apologize, this was a marking from Oh, just like the looking, trying to count the ribs, but unrelated to our purposes right now. Um, like the nodule right there on the right side, or is that not what you're talking about? The perihilar chunks and stuff, or not so much? Yeah, I would certainly say perihilar fullness, and in kind of in combination with lower extremity edema, the bivascular rail, leading to a picture of pul some pulmonary edema volume overload here. Um, Dr. Albert, do you have any yeah, let me comment here. <clears throat> first of all, the first comment is really important. This is a terrible inhalation. And, um, and when you have low lung volumes, any kind of parenchymal um, um, infiltrates could easily just be atelectasis and, and vascular crowding. I wouldn't call um, uh, fluid overload on this, on this film because of it. 
the fact that the diaphragms are so high uh, really implies that he's got a lot more ascites than we're talking about. The one thing I'd point out, it's not big enough, but uh, I use your pointer and point out the azagous vein. A little higher, a little higher right there. No, lower, 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 a little bit to the left, left of the trachea, right there. That is the azagous vein. <laughs> Moving in. <laughs> and um, and that implies that right-sided pressures are elevated, unless this is a supine film, and I don't I don't think it is. I can't. Uh, no, it was upright. It was upright. Yeah. So the azagous vein elevation would be consistent with um, our azagous vein dilation would be consistent with a little bit of right atrial pressure elevation. The infiltrate you see on the film, you know could be edema, but I wouldn't call it because of the terrible low lung volumes. Um, it's also a lordat lordotic film, um, and that could account for some uh, increase in the size of the azagous vein. Awesome, thank you. That's always incredibly helpful. Um, and I was certainly, I was cheating a little bit because on subsequent imaging that's not included here, he did have a small right-sided effusion with ongoing evidence of edema, but obviously here you can't um, say, oh, I don't know what this marking is on my screen. <laughs> strong, strong work in my eyes. Um, so um, what, so we've talked about alpha-1 antitrypsin, we've talked about hemochromatosis, ceruloplasm. Um, Excellent. So um, he finally did get a ceruloplasm. which was 18. Um, the lower limit of normal is um, 20. So what, does, what is that suggestive of? A, what additional studies do we need to confirm? Can we look at his eyes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, what are we looking for there? Fleischer. Kaiser Fleischer ring. Excellent. Um, so we did have ophthalmology come look at his eyes. They did not appreciate Kaiser Fleischer ring. Um, and this was something that I um, learned in reading about this case some more. I think is all a lot, as always, a lot of the classic things we learn for diseases are not as common in the typical presentation. So once you have a low ceruloplasm or high suspicion of uh, Wilson's disease, the, one of the best diagnostic studies is actually a 24 hour urine copper. Mm -hmm. um, an elevated 24-hour urine copper is suggested of that, and then you will typically send in first-degree relatives the um, ATP37B um, genotype looking for the mutation, the um, heterozygous re or the recessive mutation that contributes to Wilson disease. Um, and so this patient actually, as I said, when he came in was was normal mental status and. This, these were the labs that he came into his outpatient provider with. Um, I met him when he was transferred here for evaluation for a liver transplant um, and fairly quickly decompensated to hepatic encephalopathy. Fortunately, he was transplanted um, and has done really well for the last year. That's cool. Um, but this is, um, it's certainly something you always need to think about in a new cirrhotic. Um, we didn't even get into all of like the autoimmune antibodies and templates to send, but that would be the one other, uh, uh, Peter did mention like PBC and PSC, um, but worth, those are the other areas to evaluate in a new diagnosis of cirrhosis. So um, getting to, I'm just gonna. Hey man, I have a quick question. Yeah, please. Cereoplasm, is that something where we need to get the follow-up year in 24 because it's actually found more commonly and isn't as yeah, so I'll talk about that. Oh, okay. Ceruloplasm is a, it's a, there's a couple things about it that make it not okay. as good of a test as we'd like it to be. Um, so Wilson's disease is um, prevalent, is present worldwide at about one per 30,000. Again, autosomal recessive impairment in biliary popper excretion, so it accumulates in a variety of organs, especially liver, cornea, and brain. Um, typically, patients are diagnosed between 5 and 35. Um, but 
uh, patients have been diagnosed as young as like one or two years old, especially in East Asian populations, and as old as their 70s. Um, this disease does typically have 100% penetrance, um, and so most everyone who has two copies of the receptive gene will eventually exhibit a trait. Um, and then up to 5% present with this acute liver failure and Coombs negative hemolytic anemia, which is also what he did have, um, and those two together were contributing to that incredibly high billy as well as the low hemoglobin. Um, so just a reminder, I think it's always important to remember acute liver failure. Um, the definition is a rapid onset of less than 12 weeks um, development of severe acute liver injury um, defined as impaired synthetic function, coagulopathy, and, and encephalopathy, all three must be present, in a person with a previously normal liver. Um, the people with Wilson's disease often have like an acute on chronic liver disease picture um, or present with this advanced fibrosis cirrhosis picture because they've got long chronic liver injury going on. Um, so the other features of Wilson's disease um, or things that should make your suspicion higher in the setting of someone coming in with clear liver injury are that Coombs negative hemolytic anemia. Um, the mechanism is not perfectly well understood, but the thought is that in the setting of acute liver failure, severe liver injury, the hepatocyte necrosis releases excess copper that causes oxidative damage to the red blood cell membrane. Um, and just like they can't stand it. He interestingly did have a smear um, that was normal although that may, it may have been too early in his course to catch um, the damage. Um, other things that you might expect um, in people with Wilson's disease are that relatively low elevation AST-ALT with a two to one ratio generally, um, normal to low alpha, low uric acid, and a correct coagulopathy does not correct with vitamin K and rapidly progressive renal failure. Um, and he actually had, um, his uric acid was not checked. Interestingly, I guess it was checked once at the outside facility, but wasn't trended here. Um, but he did have a coagulopathy. He received the three doses of um, subcutaneous vitamin K, and his coagulate uh, his INR went from 385 to like 355, and then back up above four. Um, so did not correct. And then um, he did have rapidly progressive renal failure and was briefly on CBBH prior to his transplant. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, this is one of the scoring systems for um, the likelihood of Wilson's disease, um, and a score greater than four, greater than or equal to four makes Wilson's disease likely. Um, so, talking about some specific findings like Kaiser Fleischer rings, um, they are present in 100% of people with the neurologic symptoms typically like behavioral changes and um, mm -hmm. disturbances that are more consistent with like a subacute presentation, but only present in 30 to 50% of people who present with acute liver failure. Um, and then along with that, the ceruloplasm. So ceruloplasm is an acute phase reactant. Um, and so it can be artificially low in people who are heterozygous or without any um, Wilson's disease in the setting of, or sorry, um, let me see, I wrote it down. Um, so it can be artificially high in people with um, Wilson's disease who are, under, who are under an acute stress, like an acute liver failure. So in him, his ceruloplasma of 18, that was just below the cutoff of 20, was probably artificially high because of the acute stress he was under. And then likewise, up to 20% of people who are either heterozygous or don't have the trait at all have a low ceruloplasm at baseline. So that's why it's kind of only, if you, I mean, if you have a ceruloplasm that's very, very low of like two, you probably have Wilson's disease. But anywhere kind of near 20, it's difficult to interpret. Um, and then, so the urinary copper is one of the, the best um, tests other than a liver biopsy. Um, a urinary copper, the range is, sorry, I'm trying to remember exactly. Um, I think, yeah, um, so 30 to 80. And 80 to 100 is indeterminate, and then greater than 100 is um, likely consistent with, um, or sorry, 70 to 100 um, is the normal range. And then, but anything 90 to 100 is, indeterminate range that could be consistent with liver disease, and then you need a biopsy to prove it. Um, his urinary 24-hour copper 
was greater than 4,000. So there was real, like that was, we got the cerule plasma that was low and got a 24 hour urine um, copper that was okay. left no question of what the disease process might be. Um, and then, so in terms of treatment, um, treatment largely depends on degree of disease at the time of presentation. Anyone who presents with acute liver failure needs a transplant, um, but will still need lifelong maintenance therapy um, after the transplant to avoid recurrence. Um, and the, this just kind of goes, goes through um, different recommendations for when people need treatment based on the um, AASLC. Oftentimes you can use the NASR scoring system. Um, so a score of greater than or equal to eight indicates the a high likelihood of death without liver transplant. And I think his score on admission was 10 um, with that really high ability and the elevated INR. Um, so the goal, if it's less than eight, would be to try some chelation therapy, try oral zinc, um, as well as penicillamine, and ideally not have to um, get them all the way to liver transplantation, often within three to six months, you can normalize the serum copper. Um, but sometimes that's not possible. Awesome. Well, um, any other questions or thoughts? If they already have neurological deficits at the time of presentation, do they still get considered for transplant the same way? Yes. Uh, it, well, it, it, Yes, it depends. Um, and so a lot of the trans, when they have neurologic deficits, their the requirements for having social support are higher, um, that they're really going to need a clear social support that's going to be able to um, help them. But oftentimes with transplant, at least partially the neurologic deficits are reversible. So for him, like his having encephalopathy was completely reversible with transplant. Um, and then people who have like mood instability, um, irritability, lack of inhibition, things like that, generally, if the more acute those neurologic deficits are, the more likely they are to be reversible with transplant. And so the more kind of equally they would be considered, if that makes sense. Good question, though. Do you far across the, like, is it winging? There's like something, I have like a picture of this in my head. Oh, yeah. So there's like, um, there's tremors and like autonomic disinhibition um, with more severe ne neurologic manifestation. Um, and so I imagine maybe that's it, but I'm not sure. I can't remember that exactly. But yeah, I can imagine with like tremors. And it's, it's not quite like the chorea that you see with um, like a Huntington, but it's um, dystonia and tremors more. <laughs> Yeah, nice job, guys. Um, thanks for your time, and we'll see you guys tomorrow for another week. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.